Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? So I have a problem. I talk really, really loud, and I'm using a microphone. So if it gets unbearable, you know, just shout, wave your hand, plug your ears, or something like that, OK? So uh, today, we're going to have a very intense training that's going to cover a lot of words. We're not only going to get into secure development. Actually, we're going to get to secure development only at the end of the training. We're going to do some real hardcore legal vandalism. We're going to do some hacking. We're going to learn some uh, techniques. We're going to talk about attack methodologies. We're going to talk about attack tool sets. And we're going to learn a couple of basic application security attacks just to get you started. The course is designed specifically to get you into the field of application security at the lowest core, at the level of the hacker. Okay? So, uh, during the course, we're going to have three phases of exercises. Since this is a really short course, it will only have about eight or nine, hour, nine hours, we're going to do the learning part and the exercise part simultaneously, as much as possible. But it's going to be hard, so we're going to do the training in several phases. We're going to see that we have a training Wi-Fi. You can connect to it right now. There's no password whatsoever to it, okay? Uh, we have an OWASP official application called WebGoat in there. I'm going to set up the URL there in a second, so we'll be able to connect. The, you can actually connect to it right now to, see, to make sure that it's working for you. The address is the following address. Once you connect to our Wi-Fi, you won't be able to get to there from the uh, conference Wi-Fi, so please switch right now. Although it's not necessarily required for the training to actually do some hands-on, those of you that want to feel or get some more practical experience in using the tools, I really recommend start working directly with that. We, we spread some discon keys among you, and uh, I know some of you guys really like the design of the discon keys, but we really, really need them back because we want to uh, spread them among the rest of the participants. We only have 35 discon keys, and you, you, you should have seen the face of the, the guy at the store when I asked for 35 discount kids. Like, what? So anyway, give them back to us or move them to the, next, to the guy next, the, the guy will get beside you so they'll be able to couple the, uh, the training lab uh, tool set, okay? Now what do you need to copy from the discount keys? There's directory the in the discount keys that list the operating system type supported by the training. There's one for Windows, Mac, Linux, various versions of each, and so on and so on. You need to copy the OVA file in the root of the disk key, okay? That's the training lab, the main training lab, and there's various tools in a directory with the name of your operating system. I really, really, really recommend copying the Windows directory if you have Windows, but if you, you know, you have the budget and you have Mac or Linux or whatever, we're kind of uh, adjusted to that. You need at least 10 gigabytes of free space in your hard drive for the entire toolkit to work. But if you can't afford the space, 200, giga, 200 megabytes would suffice for everything beside the VM, OK? So you don't really need to uh, you know, delete half of the content of your hard drive. You don't have enough, but 10 giga is recommended. So, uh, uh, Roy here, Roy, can you raise your hand? Just get up so uh, people will see you. He's going to assist me in uh, the various course phases by going between you and assisting anybody that gets stuck either without a discount key or with configuration of the tool set. Avi hopefully will help, uh, help as well and you know, we'll figure out what to do if there's more demand. We're going to start, as I mentioned earlier, with training in three phases. Installing and configuring the tool set is relatively complicated at the first time you do it. So initially, we'll just hack with the browser. No tools are required. We're going to learn how to hack through the GUI. We're going to use our browser against WebGoat or other websites in the internet, such as Hackathon, just to get us started in delivering attack payloads, OK? Um, uh, the second phase of the training will be performed on a tool set called Web Security Dojo. It's a virtual machine, a fantastic virtual machine by Maven Security that contains everything, both the attack tools 
and the target vulnerable websites. Demo websites that simulate vulnerabilities in the application security field. And we will be using that to uh, perform some of the attack. And the benefit of that is that you won't, be able, won't need to configure the tool set yet. In order to get that VM started, you need to install VirtualBox, the one located in the directory of your own specific, uh, in your own specific directory in the disk okay? You need to install VirtualBox and then double click on the OVA file. You'll get an import pop-up. Just press import, next, 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 and eventually play. And you'll see the, virtual bo uh, 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 the Web Security Dojo virtual machine. It looks something like this. Nice, can, can do ninja stuff, okay? So that's the tool set we'll be discussing a lot about it, and both me and Owe will go between you to help you out with the various configuration elements of it and with the actual testing. Finally, eventually, to or more near the end of the course, we're going to teach you how to install the various tools on your own station, Linux, Mac, PC, whatever, okay? Uh, we're going to teach you how to configure it, why the elements of the configuration we're going to use are required, how to use it for automated testing or manual testing, and so on and so on. I uh, hope you guys are excited. I'm going to give a couple of uh, notes here, just for you to remember. Everything that we're going to teach in this class is actually a real attack. You're using it against your bank or, you know, your e-commerce website is, you know, it's a felony. You can go to jail for doing that. So I really, really recommend doing it on training websites or as a part of your job. Instead of going on and trying to hack the, I don't know, some security agency or whatever. Uh, and the second comment is that it really opens your eye to see how the world really works. Now, since this is a recorded uh, session, it's going to be online, I won't be incriminating myself by showing you actual vulnerability in real websites, even though I typically do that in my courses. I show real vulnerability in real websites without hacking them, just showing the potential to do it. Uh, so we'll be avoiding showing real websites, but I will give you hints about various vulnerable websites you can check out later just to see the actual vulnerabilities that they contain or to see the obvious flaws in the design that they have. After a while, after getting the, this specific course and surfing around in the internet, some of you will be really shocked to see how many mistakes developers do that can be abused using these techniques. Okay? Now, in order to get us started, I'm going to switch back and forth from this uh, initial setup design. Those of you who haven't written down the URL of WebGoat, the IP or the training lab, please take a second to take a picture of it with your phone because you won't be able to see it later on, okay? Just you know, have like a nice snapshot session right now. I don't know how it will take with the, the, the recording and all, but let's hope to be well get started. I've already really introduced me, which is fun, so I can skip the entire boring introduction part. We're going to talk about the various techniques, but in order to talk about the various techniques, you have to cover the basic elements, okay? And the basic elements is A, the basic methodology of hacking, and B, the methods we, which we will use and the protocol we will use to perform the various attack phases, okay? So, in general, in order to hack an application, I don't necessarily need a tool set. I only need to be able to intervene or manipulate the element which is potentially vulnerable. Those elements are typically called input delivery vectors. Those are also called parameters. Each application in the uh, internet world is being designed in a manner in which the client side application delivered deliver some sort of elements to the server-side application to make the application dynamic. So let's say it's an e-commerce application, you deliver the ID of the product that you want to purchase. Let's say it's an e-commerce application and you want to buy a couple of products, you deliver the quantity. There's input being delivered from the client side to the server side throughout the course of the session in the application. So in order to hack an application, we typically need to manipulate those values. If we can manipulate them in the GUI level, you know, through the URL or through messing up with the text boxes, that's fine. If we need to intervene at a deeper level, such as hidden parameters, things we cannot see, we 
typically use something called an interception proxy. Now, an interception proxy is simply a tool that enables us to intervene, stop the communication, intercept it, change whatever we want to change in the transmission sent from the client to the server, and then resend it. So let's say there's a secret flag in, it, uh, in the client side code which uh, says is admin equals false. We can intercept that flag in an interception proxy, change the is admin flag to true, and send the request to the server side. But this is a very exaggerated uh, uh, example, but I have seen similar incidents in the real world, so it won't be that surprising to see it in various applications these days, even in 2017. So, our training will focus on OWASP ZAP. There's other tools we use in the industry, primarily Burp Suit, either free edition or, prof or professional edition, which is just as simple as that, and Fiddler, which is used for you know, very specific tasks when we have problems with uh, interceptor requests in certain uh, situations. But OWASP ZAP has the advantage of including a free automated application security scanner and a number of other features which are not available in other free products at the same level. So we'll be using it as our main interception proxy for the course. We'll discuss other uh, proxies for various reasons, but I really, really commend, even those, those of you who are using Berg, for the purpose of the course and for the purpose of the automation phases of the course, to install OSB ZAP and use it for the various uh, elements of the training, okay? We'll be covering OSB ZAP and how to install it in uh, either clear text en environments or SSL driven environments. We'll be using it in Web Security Dojo or we'll be using it on your PC, it doesn't matter. But as I mentioned earlier, in the initial phases, we'll be using simply uh, um, our browser, okay? Now in the training kit that you got, each of you should see A, the virtual box and the, vir oh, and the web security dojo uh, uh, virtual machine file. Those are the main files that you need to copy. But you'll also have a JDK, a Java Development Kit installer, and you should also see a ZAP installer. There's one for every uh, operating system that we could think of, okay, except, you know, DOS or whatever you guys uh, decided to bring. But we have it for most modern operating systems, so you can pretty much handle with that. We also brought in Firefox. The reason we, want, we brought in Firefox is that uh, it's not necessarily defining the system proxy or changing anything in the system proxy, so we won't get any garbage or so much garbage information that will confuse you in the interception proxy. We don't want to write anything, to uh, route anything that we don't need to mess with to the interception proxy. So I really recommend installing Firefox, which is also located in the, dis the, the lab disk key. Uh, and use it for the purpose of the course to, uh, due, due to other reasons as well, okay? So that's our main recommendations. You can see the various configurations required uh, here, but we'll get back to them later on at the installation sessions. Initially, we're just going to listen and watch. In terms of priority, your first priority should be to listen and understand. And the second priority should be to do as much as you can while understanding what I'm saying, to do what you can during the training. Now, we're going to use a couple of training platforms. We're going to use WebGoat just because it's very easy to install and you have it in your laptops. We're going to use the various platforms, the Web Security Dojo, primarily uh, Insecure Web App and WhatsApp, very good for training for specific, uh, specific elements. And we're going to use uh, internet websites just to call and search and see how they look like, okay? That's pretty much it. So in order to kick or get it started, I want to show you how it looks like, okay? I don't need you to do the entire configuration right now. I just want you to take a look at what I'm doing. I want to start off zapping my computer and explain how it works. And then crawl around the internet just a little bit for you to see what's going on, okay? So um, that's our zap uh, tool is written in Java includes numerous tools originally based of very ancient tools these days called Powers Proxy, no longer maintained, okay? It includes a couple of nice features. The main feature which is relevant for us is the ability to document, list, intercept, and modify HTTP, HTTPS, or WebSocket requests, okay? The main protocols being used in the, in the internet these days. Now, the way it works, it's really 
a proxy that's not just its name, interception proxy. It's not just a different category. It is a proxy, just like a proxy that you have in your organization. If you're trying to access the internet from a, a big organization, you need to configure a proxy typically to gain access. That's exactly how it works. So in order to use it, we have to configure the browser to use it, okay? As a proxy. There's various ways to do it for various browsers. I'm going to explain it on Firefox. I'm going to list the methods to do it in Chrome and IE as well, but I really recommend using Firefox for, the, for various purposes. Um, options, those of you who want to do it right now, you don't have to do it, just take a look. We're going to configure the actual proxy. And um, you know what, I'm going to do it in a bit uh, easier method. I have a plugin here, you also have it in your disco keys, called Foxy Proxy. It enables you to define real quickly uh, interception proxies into your browser. Just selecting the proxy address and post enables you to connect to it. Now the proxy actually listens to a specific port in your computer, okay? If we get to the proxy configuration, I'm going to show you, Tools, options, local proxy, don't worry, you'll get to it uh, later on. The proxy is listening to a specific port. It's pretty hard to discern this from this distance, but I'm listening to port 9998 or 9999. That's the port I chose for the proxy to listen to. Now, in order to intercept the request from the browser, I'm telling my browser, hey, instead of accessing the internet directly, go to the proxy first. And doing that by defining the proxy server in the browser configuration. Now, instead of accessing the internet directly, the browser now sends the HTTP requests to my proxy, which then delivers them to the internet, which then routes them to the internet or you no. Know, does whatever you want in the middle. Now, the proxy does a couple of things at this phase. A, any access to a website, the proxy will document and present in the various reviews and history. Let, let's access a specific website, for example, OASP. Let's see if it works. Good. As you can see, it's, as I said, it's really hard to see uh, because of the size and this distance, uh, but there's actually uh, pages in OASP being presented here in various ways, okay? And the proxy can identify, at the very least, some of them. Let's see, those are the various pages that, uh, and content that are being downloaded from us that you can see in your visual representation in the browser. Okay? So far, so good? Not so much. That's okay. That, that's the beginning. There are going to be many, many, many more moments like that, but we're just starting. Once we get to the, the specific configuration space, you understand. So, eventually, what I just demonstrated is I'm configuring my browser to use a proxy and use it to access the internet instead of accessing the internet directly. Any browser supports it and the proxies know these days how to handle many of the uh, elements that are supposed to prevent such intervention, such as many in the middle prevention or protection in SSL. So we're going uh, to configure our proxy later on to use a uh, uh, to use it for the various purposes of testing, but at the moment I want to explain a little bit about the actual protocol being used between the client and the server. What's the protocol, wh what are the different versions and the differences between them, how does it work, why does the proxy, uh, why, why can you change the protocol, and so on and so on. To understand that, I'm going to give you a quick glimpse at the protocol. It's going to be hard to see, but don't worry, you'll see it soon in the presentation which will be much, much more clear. That's HTTP. That's the protocol most of the internet is built on. In this case, HTTP 1.1, okay? It's a textual protocol that you can read with your eyes and understand every portion of it without much difficulty. Most of the names in the protocol make some sense, twisted sense, but sense, okay? And in order to hack any application, we should be able to at least manipulate some elements of the various requests. Now, to get us started with the protocol, how about we magnify the relevant text a little bit? Okay, so an HTTP request typically has the following format. Get method URL version. That's it, method URL version. That's the entire HTTP request. 
So in order to access any website in the internet, my browser, behind the scenes, sends a line of text ended by two enters that begins with the method get post whatever the method is, a URL, the page you're trying to access in, to access in the server, and the version of the protocol being used, HTTP 1, HTTP 1.1, and so on and so on, okay? To prove my point, and let's, let's hope it works, let's just disable the presentation and get to a nice command line window. Let's, uh, let's see if it works, I'm not sure I have done it here, no, I don't have it here. Not, I said I would be, I said I'll use uh, Zap, uh, but in some instances, because it's more convenient to me, I'll, I'll be using Burp. I'm going to prove my point uh, by accessing Google with a single line, okay? Just to show you how it's been done. Um, so, I'm gonna read out loud what I'm doing. I'm configuring my interception proxy to access www.google.com to port 80. Let's hope it works, okay? I'm going to write a single line, get slash the root URL, HTTP slash 1.1. Enter, enter. Let's see if it works. What happened? What you see is that the server responded with something. I'm going to copy it to a notepad and magnify uh, the writing so we'll be able to figure out what we got, okay? I think that should be uh, clear to the guys in the back. That's the request I sent, simply a single line the, and with two enters at the end, two uh, carriage return line field characters at the end, okay? And the server responded with some response that typically includes both HTTP headers and HTML, okay? That's how it typically works. We can access most websites with this single line, although these days, both are more complicated and they provide additional information to the website about the accessing entity, okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, the format of an HTTP request, and you'll see it in you know, any website you'll access today, is request method, request URL, and version, followed optionally by a couple of HTTP headers, typically additional lines coming after the first line. Those headers include information about the accessing entity. For example, a user agent, which type of browser is accessing the server side, or host, which host are we trying to access in case the accessing entry point is a proxy, etc., etc. So the first, uh, well, not necessarily the first, the, most of those headers come to signify something to the server on the accessing entity, the browser. Finally, and depending on the HTTP method being used, there's optional data found after the header section of the page, okay? Uh, which is, uh, for our purposes, we'll, we'll call it post data, okay? So the post data will include various parameters that the application is trying to deliver to the server. Think about it like uh, an input section. This is how the browser typically transfers large quantities of content, either through the URL or through the body method, okay? Now, the HTTP response have a, very, have a very similar format as well. It has a format of the version of the HTTP, some sort of access code or response code, 200, 302, 404, those of you who recognize the, the number, and a description of the code, okay? Now, if we get back to the example with Google that we had, you'll see with, that we accessed Google with a specific request and we got HTTP 1.1, signifying that the response is also in the protocol that we access. 302, which is typically a message that says, hey, it's not here, it's there. It's a redirect message. It's telling us that the resource that we tried to access isn't found in the address that we accessed. And found, which is the description of the message of the response, okay? Now there's various headers here as well. 
but the server headers are typically different. Although there are some headers that are informative, that tell us which type of server it is or what time it is, many headers are actually instructions to the browsers, telling the browser what to do, okay? So for example, the cache control private element tells the browser, hey, don't store cache here, okay? No need to store any search history. And there's a, the location header, which tells the browser, hey, go to that specific address through the redirect, due to the redirect, okay? So it's instructions from the server to the browser in order for the browser to know how to behave with the website. Now, the HTML content in the body, which is optional these days, by the way, because there's REST, AJAX, and a couple of other technologies that we use these days, is actually being passed by the browser. And anything inside a tag, the HTML head, textbook says, hrefs, is actually a presentation instruction to the browser. The browser renders this information and presents it as GUI, as long as it's in a tag, okay? All of that is basic information. I know for those of you who are new, it's new, but those of you who are developers or experienced developers, it should probably be uh, trivial. But let's start with the interesting part, the hacking-related part, okay? Let's talk about HTTP methods and HTTP parameters, two key elements in hacking. HTTP methods, we're not going to cover everything, especially with WebDAV, we're going to cover the basic methods. We typically hear about get and post. Now, get, at least historically, the purpose is for you to get information on the server, okay? It typically is a method that does not include any information in the HTTP body. It only includes the first line, which is the method URL version and a couple of headers ended by two enters, two CRF characters, okay? It looks like, let's copy request from a zap. That's a typical get request, okay? I'll just modify the window. Get, oh, it's hard to see here, just some cheat tricks. Good, so there's the method get, that's the URL, which if you'll notice carefully, includes various elements. It includes the protocol, it includes uh, the full URL of the website, it includes the directories, in the website and it includes the target file that the browser is trying to access, okay? There's a couple of headers that provide information to the server about the browser, and that's a get request. The post request, however, is slightly different. Uh, I'm going to simulate one in a second. Um, let's see how. Let's see if us pass a form here. Nope. This is a guest request, so I'll just manually craft a post request just for a second. A post request would typically look something like that. There will be post here as the HTTP method. And there'll be additional parameters here. Two enters after the end of the header section. Like, I don't know, user equals something and password equals something. Let's say if, if it was a login page or whatever reason. There'll also be a header called content length that signifies how many characters are found in the body, okay? So if here there's, I don't know, 15 characters, I haven't counted, there'll be a, the number 15 in the content length header, okay? Now those methods are the main methods being used in HTTP, in HTML, in various forms that you see, okay? With the exception of modern REST implementations, POST and GET is pretty much what you'll see online. POST is a method historically designed to post information to the server, to send information from the client side to the server. However, eventually, what happened is that both methods were used for client-server interaction and for parameter delivery. The reason is that you can actually deliver parameters and pass them in the server side pretty much anywhere in the textual format of HTTP, okay? So to figure out where we can deliver parameters just before we get back to the methods, here's some, more, some old school methods to deliver parameters, okay? Delivering input parameters in HTTP GET is possible by appending them 
to the URL after a question mark, okay? We'll typically see that in search queries, okay? We'll see like search query equals something in the URL. For example, in OWASP website that we just demonstrated, let's just get back to it. You'll see that when I search something in OWASP, those of you that can see that, you'll see that I have the search criteria in the URL. So the browser created or appended, more accurately, a parameter to the URL of the page, and the parameter includes a parameter equals value sequence, okay? So the server is now getting that URL and is able to pass the parameters out of it and figure out that the user sent some input. And then you know, the server can do whatever he wants with the input, whatever the developer intended it to do. So that's one method to deliver inputs. And if, as I, I, I remind you, if input is being delivered from the client to the server, we as hackers can mess with it. So we can you know, do all the various attacks that we're going to talk about today to it. We're going to uh, inject malicious payloads, we're going to manipulate with flags, we're going to do a couple of things to that input if there's something significant in there or if the developer is passing it incorrectly. Okay? So the second type of uh, method that I mentioned is post. And post, I'll just show the presentation again. In HTTP post, the parameters are delivered in HTTP body. You see it. Uh, not how, let's use a marker here, probably would be easier to see. You'll see it here, okay? That's the section of uh, the parameters in HTTP post, and you'll see that unlike get, which, which has a question mark to separate the URL from the parameters in order for the server to know where the URL stops and the parameter starts, in HTTP post there's no point in using a question mark, the parameters are simply placed directly at the body part, okay? After the header section of the HTTP. There's also additional methods to deliver parameters. You can also deliver parameters in HTTP headers, such as the cookie or just any headers, or even when you upload the file, which has a very specific convention in HTTP, you can deliver parameters throughout the convention of the file upload request called multipart, okay? So, point is, we can deliver parameters anywhere in HTTP. So unlike the original intention, you can deliver it parameters both in GET and in POST, in both methods. So any method can be used for various attacks and manipulations. Other important methods for our purposes are HEAD and OPTIONS, okay? I'm going to skip trace track these days, got a little bit obsolete, okay? OPTIONS is a method that uh, causes the server, if it supports the method, to tell me, hey, the following HTTP methods are supported. Get, put, delete. Okay? The server actually tells me as a response whether or not it supports the specific method, the method methods that I'm trying to access. Okay? Or trying to activate. And head is a very interesting HTTP method because it's actually the same as get and post. It accesses an entry point in the server and activates it, but the server does not present any content, okay? The server does not respond with any specific content. Let's see. So don't schedule. Okay, so um, those four methods are the main methods that we'll learn about. There's other methods, potentially themselves, such as put and delete, and I'm not talking about the REST implementation, that can actually upload files to the servers or delete files from the servers. Various hacking uh, incidents that occurred in the past, such as a defacement incidents and so on and so on, ha happened because uh, the IT administrator did, forgot to disable the put and delete methods. And there's a number of other methods as well that, you want, that we won't be covering. But for the purposes of how our post, get, post, options, and head are key. Head can typically be used to bypass authentication enforcement because sometimes developers, specifically in Java, only protect URLs from get and post access. And head can still access the internal URLs. Even if you're not able to see the content that returns, you'll be able to execute operations there. So it's a nice, very basic hacking technique simply to replace the method instead of get or post, head, okay? That's 
one of the methods to do it. And options, you know, is just information gathering. Now, I already showed you that in the past, but a couple of interesting headers that we'll uh, use, or it's important to recognize, the host header, which is key to using a proxy. When we connect to a proxy and access the internet through the proxy, the most important header is the host header. It tells the proxy what is the original target, what is the main target, the final destination of the browser. So let's say I'm accessing Google through a proxy. The proxy knows how to or where to out the request because there's a whole threader, header with www.google.com in it. Okay? User agent tells the server which browser type is accessing it or which mobile type is accessing it, whatever. And content type and content type pretty much sense the type of content, binary, textual, and so on, JSON, and the length of the content that the browser sends. Response headers also have some very specific significance and we'll get to that throughout the various places of the course. Now, input vectors, or the places we use to hack the server side, are typically get and post, but in modern applications, we also have JSON and XML. Developers these days will most likely use this as the main source of input delivery in their application, specifically if you use platforms such as Angular, React, or other Ajax-based platforms, okay? Now, we should be able to manipulate those values with the same ease we manipulate get and post parameters. However, we won't be able to do it through a browser GUI, okay? Get and post parameters, in most cases, not all, can be manipulated just by using a browser. I don't need to do anything specific. Just to demonstrate what I'm saying, I'm going to show you a very short attack, a very simple attack, to figure out how easy it is once it's get or post, okay? I'm going to show you the training kit for our course, Web Security Dojo, okay? I'm going to start the browser here and access an application called Insecure Web App. Very nice application, you all have it in your local virtual machine. I have a login page here, I'll magnify it a little bit so you'll be able to see. So instead of getting in by knowing the user username or password, I'm going to hack it using a very simple, cheesy, and rarely uh, existing attacks these days, which is SQL injection login bypass for login pages, okay? So uh, in this case, I just bypass the login sequence of the application. I'll get to the how phase later on, and explain over more, of, I'll obviously explain more complicated uh, attack vectors than all one equals one, which is more iconic than actual practical these days. But uh, uh, the point is, I didn't need to use any tool set. Because it's a get or post parameter, I only needed to use the browser to perform whatever it is I wanted to perform. I just need to manipulate either the URL elements or the elements of the GUI and inject my payload through them. I won't be able to do it if I have a JSON or XML input because the method will be delivered in the input, in the body section of the page, and there won't be a GUI component to, uh, to alter or change it, okay? Now I'll get back to the presentation and show you how it will look like in your interception proxy. Now, JSON arrives, pretty modern method these days to deliver input from the kind of server, especially in Ajax-based application, will be uh, will look like uh, arrays of uh, value, uh, um, it, it will be an array of, uh, of parameter name value sequence in the JSON format, okay? And XML will typically include tags like HTML just in XML format, which include values either in H HTML, either in uh, XML attributes, just take a look at it, either in XML attributes or in XML body elements. All of these values, the values of the JSON elements, the parameter names in JSON, the attributes in XML, the uh, 
but I mean the, the element values in XMLs, all of those are manipulated or can be manipulated to an interception proxy. We're going to have to intercept the request that you want to change, change whatever it is you want to change, and you know, resend it to the server or forward it to the server. There's also additional input delivery methods these days, more complicated methods. There's web sockets that can you know send any request regardless of the format. There's no real limitation here. And there's a, see, GWT, which is a bit more complicated textual format, and there's binary formats, such as AMF. We won't be learning about those formats in the course, and sometimes when you, you know, use your hacking tool set, you'll see those binary or complicated protocols. It is possible to manipulate them just the same, but you typically need the interception proxy to include a plugin or an extension that is able to uh, reformat or present the content that you want to manipulate in a presentable method, okay, presentable way, okay? Various interception proxy, burp, suit, zap, includes plugins to manipulate DWR, JWT, all that, and a couple of other more complicated formats, okay? Which are being used from time to time these days. The main content that you see out there, however, the main methods of input delivery are GET, POST, JSON, and XML. That, those are the main things that you'll see and the main things that you'll have to mess with, okay? So, since I, need, I think that you guys need some hands-on exercise, I think you should wake up a little bit before the break we're going to have anyway, uh, how about we start installing the kit right now Okay? And we'll try to access a couple of components. Now, is there anyone here in the audience that, uh, that didn't get the disk key, the insertion disk key? Good. Roy? Roy, can you see those, uh, entity, those uh, participants? Let's see? Okay, the, those of you that have a disk key and haven't returned it to us, uh, just follow it to somebody who doesn't have it, okay? Anyone here, Mr. Bisconkey? Anyone? Good. Okay, so, um, can you help them out with this one, just follow it before them? Take another one. Let them for me. Good, so, I want you to install, I want you to copy everything we mentioned earlier they should copy, or a specific library uh, and the OVA file inside the disk key, at the root of the disk key. But what I want you to install is VirtualBox, most of all. It's a very simple file, it's a, it's a very simple installation process, nothing too complicated. That's the file that you should see, I'll just show it to you. To be DMG file for Mac, for those of you with Mac, but that's the file you should see and install. A simple next, next, next installation. The only problem you may have, and you may have it, is if your virtua virtualization flag in your BIOS is not open. If your virtualization flag in your BIOS is not open, skip installing it until the lunch break, when I'll explain how to handle it, okay? And use the other tools we're going to explain in a moment, okay? So anyone that doesn't have a virtualization flag open, you know, just avoid it for now. Don't use it, okay? Um, the second tool set you're going to use, you're not going to use it on a, our virtualization platform, we're going to use it on your local actual PC, is OWASP ZAP. Now what I want you to do right now, in addition to installing VirtualBox, install JDK, Java Development Toolkit, which isn't necessarily required, but you know, it's a good baseline and by installing this toolkit, we make sure that Zap is working on your station. So please install it right now, okay? JDK version 8. After installing it, you can start the Zap installation, a very simple next exec installation. And you should be able, uh, you know, to get Zap started, you should have an icon on your desktop, just double click it, you should have OSP Zap on your screen, okay? Now, initially, initially, 
I want you to access either the training Wi-Fi to the web goat application. I'm going to access it right now with you. Okay, it doesn't work. Let's see. It's not working, we'll use hackers on, uh, uh, online, okay? Should work better. Training lab open, let's see. That's the one you try to access? Training lab? Let's see. Maybe that's In my case, it just connected. It just takes a little bit of time, I don't know, a couple of seconds. The address here is the following address. Let's see. Assuming there's no surprises. See if there's something disconnected, maybe? Okay, we'll set it up in a section. I don't, in a second, I don't want to uh, to delay you in the initial session. So what I want you to act to do is uh, at the moment access uh, after you install JDK and Zap, just using your browser access Hackathon. That's Hackathon. Those of you who haven't seen it in the past, it's an online. Uh, Training application that you can use. I just access it through my browser so you'll be able to see it. Application by Rapid7. You'll be using it for various purposes or just to see that the toolset is working, the purposes of this course. The purposes of this course. Let's see. Let's see? Okay. That's Hackazone. You can access it online to the following address. Hackazon webscantest.com. Okay? Can you see it? Let's magnify it. HTTP hackazon.webscantest.com. Okay? <laughs> Firefox, Chrome, whatever you want at the moment. At the, at later on, at the world of force, I'd recommend Firefox. Yes. Okay? So access this website, should be able to uh, see the following user interface. By the way, WebGoat works, it's just very slow. I can see right now that it actually did work when I connected to the Wi-Fi. It's just super slow. I guess it's not handling the load, but we'll see what to do, okay? So that's WebGoat. If you access the, uh, the training lab, you should see that GUI. And if you access Hackathon, okay, you should be able to see the following GUI. Now what I want you to do is just call a little bit in the application with your browser, access a couple of links that to see that it's working for you while you're installing JDK and Zap. Why? Or you know, more accurately, after you finished installing the JDK, VirtualBox, Zap, and whatever, activate OWASP Zap and wait, okay? Should give, take you a couple of minutes, five minutes. I'm going to give you the time to do it. Okay? There's no point starting the course for the vast majority of you if those elements are not configured. You lag behind. You won't be able to experience the course like you want you to experience it. So really invest the time to try and get everything working right now. Okay? So. After activating OSP Zap, you should see a blank screen. Don't worry, I won't rush forward. I'll give you guys the opportunity to copy and uh, uh, join us. So in order, you know, to, let's, let's uh, do the smart thing. We're going to take a short break right now of 20 minutes. 
during those 20 minutes, I hope that you A, drink, eat, do whatever you want, and at least start the installation processes of VirtualBox, import the OVA file by double-clicking on it, install JDK, and install OWASP ZAP. Those of you who are really fast, install Firefox as well, okay? At the end of the uh, break, please have ZAP, OWASP ZAP open on your screen. Don't do anything with it. Just have it open because you're going to start and configure it, okay? It's probably the only complicated session for the day, even though it's not really complicated, okay? So do your best to be prepared for it. That's it. Uh, please be back in class in uh, 11 and 10 minutes. My clock is the only one that counts, okay? Don't be late. That's it.